thanks to Stamps.com for supporting Muller, she wrote. With Stamps.com, you can access all the services of the post office right from your desk. Right now, use the code AG for this special offer, a four-week trial that includes postage and a digital scale. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the radio microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in AG. That's Stamps.com and enter AG. You'll be glad you did. So to be clear, Mr. Trump has no financial relationships with any Russian oligarchs. That, that's what he said. I, I, that's what I said. That's obviously what the, the, our position is. I'm not aware of uh, any of those activities. I have been called a surrogate at a time or two in that campaign, and I didn't have not have communications with the Russians. What do I have to get involved with Putin for? I have nothing to do with Putin. I've never spoken to him. I don't know anything about him other than he will respect me. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. So, it is political. You're a communist. No, Mr. Green. Communism is just a red herring. Like all members of the oldest profession, I'm a capitalist. Hello, and welcome to Muller, She Wrote. I'm your anonymous host, A.G., back from my super-secret vacation. (laughs) Uh, I had an amazing time, but I missed all of you immensely. Uh, You guys are my family now. So, my uh, Mueller junkies, I missed you all. Without you guys, I'm pretty sure everyone would just look at me like I was insane. Uh, (laughs) With me, as always, is Jaleesa Johnson. Hello. And Jordan Coburn. Hello. We have a massive episode for you today. I thought it was going to be all quiet and calm the week before the election, so I took a vacation, but no. Uh, Everything's insane. There's tons going on with early voting, voter suppression, nationalist terrorism, the Mueller investigation, secret subpoenas, Roger Stone tapes, people trying to frame Bob Mueller. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Today we have David Pagman joining us along with Natasha Bertrand to talk about Papadopoulos and the Mueller frame job. We have the CEO of BallotReady.org to talk about how you can find all the midterm voting information you need. Jordan is going to cover this week in Roger Stonehenge. And uh, Jaleesa will be reporting on some stuff from Michael Cohen. Uh, I have some information for you on a mystery subpoena fight going on with Mueller. But first, I have a couple corrections from the episode two weeks ago. I have a lot of corrections, actually. (laughs) I have three corrections. That's the most we've ever had. And I swear it's because it was 8 a.m. and it was pre-coffee. We're human. And uh, we can't ever do that. We can't ever record an episode without coffee. (laughs) This was in our hotel room, right? Yeah, this is the one in the hotel room. Yeah, that was weird. (laughs) Uh, First, dismissing something with prejudice means you cannot reopen the case. And I was wondering if Judge Alice, crazy Judge Alice, had dismissed the 10 charges from the hung jury with or without prejudice. Without prejudice means they can be retried at a later date. So I got those reversed. Also, I said Flynn worked for the DNI, but he actually worked for the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency. And I also called... Uh, Sammy the Bull Gravano, Jimmy the Bull. <laughs> Rocco Bamante. <laughs> Peter Baker. <laughs> Peter Baker, that's the best. <laughs> Richie Pagliucci. No, no, no. Michael Peterson. I was your pallbearer. <laughs> Appreciate it, Vinny. <laughs> Vinny. Nikki the Fish, what are you doing here? Uh, but before we get started, guys, on a more serious note, I wanted to take a minute to honor the men and women that lost their lives in a sacred place of worship in Pittsburgh at the Tree of Life Synagogue this week, and also the two people that were gunned down and executed at the Kroger after the racist shooter tried to enter a black church and kill people there. I'm not going to name the murderers. They do not deserve recognition, and neither does Trump, the Trump superfan bomber that sent 13 and counting packages of bombs to prominent Democrats and ex-presidents. We all know why these tragedies keep happening. It's the inflammatory rhetoric from the president, saying things like Soros, a Jewish man, is funding a caravan full of diseased ISIS people, or that uh, the quote-unquote bomb stuff is distracting uh, from his hate rallies, apparently. He incites violence with his rhetoric, and I honestly don't know what to do about it except keep resisting. Um, Keep calling out hate when you see it, and don't tolerate that bullshit from your racist uncle this Thanksgiving. Uh, Maybe a whole lot of small acts of kindness uh, and interventions on behalf of um, awesome people around the world might add up to something substantial. It's the only thing I can think, because even if we vote and we we put a house in or even flip the Senate, it's not going to stop. I can't stop him from his rhetoric. But I think if we keep marching, keep, I think there's a big march today Oh, uh, in Balboa Park. Baby, baby Trump is here <laughs> That's right. oh, nice. in San Diego yeah, yeah. Um, at two o'clock. So 
that's really all I can think we, uh, you know, to do other than not name these people who are who are doing these things, who are perpetrating this. And this is this is white national terrorism. It's oh, yeah, it's supremacy. It's white supremacy and it's terrorism. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to take a minute because we, we had a heck of a week that those were really dominating stories over the last week and a half or two. Um, and it's it's un, unimaginable what that, that those kind of things are, are happening. And I, I, I'm just I'm really shocked by it. Yeah. Um, anyway, we have a ton of news to get to this week. So let's get it started with just the facts. <laughs> All right, you guys, all the way back to last Tuesday, October 23rd, in response to Trump saying he could show us 100 photos of Mueller and Comey hugging and kissing, uh, BuzzFeed News reporter Jason Leopold shared the Justice Department's response to a Freedom of Information Act request he filed with the FBI asking for photographs of Mueller and Comey hugging and kissing each other. (laughs) The FBI says it was unable to locate any such photos. (laughs) Of the former FBI director and the special counsel, counsel hugging or kissing. Yeah, but if you're looking for something, here's a gay porn website. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? I could show you at least 100 photos. So, no, there aren't any photos of uh, Mueller and Comey making out or hugging it out. But there is that, that is... one with, uh, what is it, Trump and Comey? Yeah, Trump yeah. kissed Comey, but not really. He just whispered in his ear. Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, then Wednesday, the 24th, uh, the news started breaking about the MAGA bomber. That's what I call him. Uh, he's a Trump super fan, sending bombs to prominent Democrats, including Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, the Obamas, George Soros, James Clapper, Maxine Waters, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and CNN, to name a few. Uh, at first, Fox News and Trump hacks said this was a false flag. And I personally had a bunch of trolls tell me on Twitter that they weren't even bombs and I should shut up about it. Mm. But then the FBI director, Ray, who's a Trump appointee, and, and AG Sessions, who's a Trump appointee, held a press conference and said these were not hoax bombs. And the MAGA bomber was charged with sending explosives in the mail and transporting explosives across state lines. Uh, These bombs were a direct response to Trump's violent and divisive tweets and rhetoric about his political critics, I think. Yeah, definitely. They refused to answer questions that were of that nature. But yes, I think so, too. I mean, these are these are all people who Trump's named. Yeah. Who's called out. They did say that they could. It was pretty obvious that they were partisan in nature, the people they sent it to, which I think is even surprising that they said that. That's pretty powerful that people of the intelligence community said that. Yeah, they do usually don't even get into politics and, unless it's absolutely glaring. Um, the same day, a buried lead broke about Papadopoulos uh, and that he would be appearing before a congressional task force Thursday to tell them all about nine people who contacted him that he believes were trying to frame him and surveil him on behalf of the FBI. Papadop sent a list of nine names to the House Oversight and Government Reform Committees the previous Monday, which included Mifsud, Alexander Downer, Stefan Halper, and Sergei Milian. He also named uh, Azra Turk, Aziz Chuk, uh, what is it, Chukri, and uh, Charles Tawil, Terrence Dudley, and Gregory Baker. I don't know who those folks are, but apparently they all framed Papadop. Hmm. So (laughs) there's more Papadopoulos news coming up later. We've got Natasha to talk about that. It's going to be pretty funny. He thinks Mifsud framed him? Yeah, he thinks Mifsud was an FBI agent acting on behalf of FBI, and they they entrapped him, basically, uh, to talk about dirt uh, emails (laughs) thing. Wow, a little (laughs) self-important. He's he's really weird, man. Um, Also on the 24th, there was a blip uh, for a second about a a different sealed subpoena battle in the Mueller probe that came out in Politico. This is a second person fighting the Mueller subpoena, a grand jury subpoena that came out right around the time, same time Andrew Miller held himself in contempt of court so that he could fight the legitimacy of Mueller's appointment in in the appellate court. And it also came from the same judge, Beryl Howell, and I'm going to go over this in hot notes. Um, Then October 25th, the Daily Beast came out with a breaking story. We had reported the prior week about Trump and Mohammed Bonesaw blaming Saudi General Ahmed Assisi for the rogue killing of the Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Still Wednesday, it appeared that uh, Trump and Saudi Arabia are going to blame a Saudi general for going rogue and killing Khashoggi. Uh, Trump has been laying the groundwork for this alternative story all week, and now it appears the crown prince is parroting what Trump says. Um, First, it was a flat-out denial. Now they're blaming a rogue actor. Sound familiar? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Like when Putin denied interfering in the election, and then he blamed a rogue Chinese guy or a Mm -hmm. 400-pound guy in his bed somewhere? Yeah, yeah. This is so obvious to me, and that it's not obvious to Trump supporters is astounding, kind of. 
uh, the most interesting thing about uh, the rogue Saudi general. His name is Ahmed Assisi. And he also just happens to be the guy that Nader, child molester, was dealing with on an election interference uh, case or, you know, working with him to, to fund <clears throat> uh, interference, Russian interference in the election. Hmm. So now it appears that Trump and Mohammed Bonesaw can kill two birds with one stone, quite <laughs> literally. Uh, according to the new reporting in the Daily Beast, General Ahmed al-Asiri met in New York with Michael Flynn and other members of the transition team before Trump took office, and those meetings are under scrutiny by Mueller for foreign government attempts to discuss policy on dismantling the Iran deal while still in transition. So what we reported on the week before was considered breaking news this week. So you can check that out. Wow. Lots beans. of... Yes, beans. <laughs> beans. <laughs> Uh, lots of Roger Stonehenge news broke this week, and Jordan's going to be giving us those updates later in the show. Got like three pages of shit. <laughs> so many things yeah. on Stone this week. Stop breaking the law. <laughs> 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 then October, it was so funny. He was on. We were out at my friend's birthday last night doing a, like a karaoke thing, and apparently, I think it was Cuomo, Chris Cuomo, who had Roger Stone on talking on, on CNN, and. Like one of my friends goes, who the fuck is that guy with the eyebrows? And I'm like, oh, that's Roger Stone. He's going to be indicted next week. And he's like, how do you know that? I'm like, yeah, forget it. <laughs> um, yeah, this is way too much to it's explain. Just, yeah. <laughs> Listen to the podcast and you figure it out. Um, then October 25th, federal prosecutors confirmed in a court filing that Michael Cohen and others are still being scrutinized in an open and ongoing federal grand jury investigation. Dun, dun, dun. A while back, uh, the New York Times filed a suit asking the courts to unseal the Cohen search warrants. We've been reporting on this. Um, and this filing has the federal prosecutors telling the court not to release the information because there are numerous uncharged third parties that do not know they're named in this thing mm -hmm. and that Cohen and these numerous third parties are still part of an ongoing and open investigation. So Cohen could have more charges come out against him. Hell yeah. Also, but he has been talking a lot with Mueller. Like he's been there like 50 hours or something. I can't mm -hmm. even remember. A lot of time. He's been spending a lot of time trying probably to not be charged with whatever <laughs> that investigation is. Yeah, definitely. Uh, also, October 25th, a judge denied Devin Nunes access to secret depositions on the Steele dossier. Um, as you know, the Steele dossier is what Fusion GPS commissioned uh, from Christopher Steele. It was like a, all these uh, memorandums on all this stuff that, you know, Trump was being compromised, being used as a Russian asset, et cetera. None of it's been debunked. Um, a lot of it's been proven. Uh, and so basically Nunes sought the sealed testimony in a South Florida court case back in September, but no one had the transcripts until last week when McClatchy got a copy from the Miami Herald showing the judge felt Nunez's effort threatened to overstep congressional powers. Quote, I really need the Senate committee and the House committee to come here and explain to me why it's appropriate for them to obtain these documents. Um, that's what Judge O'Sullivan said, and then denied Nunez's request. Uh, Nunez and Grassley wanted the videos of depositions from Steele and Kramer last August. Kramer is the McCain guy that helped McCain get a copy of the dossier, oh, yeah. and then they brought it over to the FBI. And that Miami trial is set for November 26th, so we'll keep you posted. I don't know when, like, what's what? Why Miami? What's going yeah. on? It's weird. No idea. I love that though. Go back to your non-existent California <laughs> witch. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to not say those words. Witch. <laughs> <laughs> Feckless witch. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry about your ex-boyfriend. I know, man. He's in trouble. Denied. Yeah. <laughs> I just. It's adorable how he keeps getting denied almost. I know. It's sad. Yeah. Mm. Then October 26th, a story in The Atlantic dropped about Papadopoulos asking for immunity from the Senate. And joining us to talk about the possible implications is Atlantic staff writer and MSNBC contributor Natasha Bertrand. Natasha, welcome back to Mueller, she wrote. Thanks so much for having me. So I'm confused a little bit by this move because Papadop has been coming across as this innocent pawn in a deep state FBI frame job, but now he's requesting immunity from the Senate Intel Committee. What's going on? Yeah, weird, right? <laughs> it's really weird. Um, so, so essentially, he testified before the House Judiciary and Oversight Committees a couple weeks ago, and 
They're very sympathetic committees. Um, many Democrats weren't there. It was mostly Republicans who were questioning him, and he wasn't there under a subpoena. So his lawyer could essentially just say to him, you know, don't answer this question, don't answer that question, and that's exactly what she did. Um, the Senate is kind of a different story because Papadopoulos has said that he'd be willing to testify in public, and the Senate may take him up on that offer. Um, but it would look bad for him if he were to say to the Senate, you know, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm not going to answer that question um, and essentially uh, plead the fifth. But if he said if he gets immunity from the Senate, then he would feel free to testify about virtually whatever. Um, so I think that's one thing that's at play here. Another thing is that if he were the fact that he's asking for immunity, according to legal experts that I've spoken to, means that he wants to discuss potentially another crime that he hasn't been necessarily charged with, that he, but that he might be implicated in and doesn't want, he wants to feel like he's free from fear of um, prosecution for that. So there's a number of things at play here. We don't exactly know why he's asked for immunity, um, but the Senate is very unlikely to give it to him according to my sources. Um, so we just really have to wait and see at this point. But his whole thing now is that he's planning to apparently sue the U.S. government because he feels like he was entrapped by them in 2016. <laughs> so so like you kind of touched on, I guess this might suggest that there are other crimes he's committed or another crime he's committed that maybe Mueller didn't already charge him with or know about. Right. And one of those things could be him being an unregistered foreign agent of Israel. Um, that is something that Mueller did not charge him with, but he has told me in the past, and he's actually expressed, I, I believe openly on Twitter, the fact that this is something that Mueller has been kind of hanging over him. Um, he he pleaded guilty to one charge of lying to the FBI in exchange for cooperation, of course. That was kind of a very lenient thing. Um, but now there's the, still the, the ongoing fear, and his lawyer kind of confirmed this to me the other day, that he could be um, charged again, you know, with a FARA violation. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Um, and for Israel, uh, not Russia. Right. <laughs> I, I, you, a lot of times we forget how heavily they're involved with, you know, PSYOPs and Black Cube and all that stuff. Um, now, I know that Papadopoulos testified behind closed doors, like you said, to the House Judiciary and Oversight Committees last week. Maybe something came up in that line of questioning that maybe led him to ask for immunity. Like maybe they asked him about that being a, an unregistered agent. He didn't answer it because, like you said, behind the closed doors, his lawyer did tell him, you know, don't answer this question. Don't answer this question. Right. And so maybe that kind of line of questioning led his lawyer and him to ask for this immunity. It's definitely possible. Um, I don't know the timing, for example, of when he asked for immunity. That's a really good question. Um, but again, the Senate kind of said we're not going to give him immunity because he already testified um, before the House Intel Committee or before the House Judiciary and Oversight Committee. So the fact that he already testified would kind of, you know, they were already not really willing to give him immunity. And then he also kind of waived that um, the right to even ask for it when he testified before the House. So uh, you know, all signs point to the idea that since he got this new lawyer, um, Caroline Polisi, that she has advised him to ask for immunity. And, you know, she's actually been, I think, advising him against um, uh, re rescinding his plea agreement and pulling out of his plea agreement, which is something that he's been openly um, toying with. Um, but but this all seems to have started really the immunity um, request seems to have started since he got new lawyers, whether or not it came before or after his house testimony. I don't know. OK, that's interesting, because right after his closed door testimony, he went on Fox and Friends and said said he was thinking about pulling out of his cooperation agreement with Mueller. And he, I think he had said it was based on recommendations from his new legal counsel. So, like, I'm not sure. You're saying that you think that his lawyer was is uh, advising him not to back out of his cooperation agreement. Right. I don't think that any lawyer and, and again, this is based on lawyers that I've spoken to who have watched this case. I don't think that any lawyer would advise him to do that. They pretty much I mean, his old lawyers have, have talked about it and they've said that it seems like a really like it would not be a good idea. Um, and people who are observing this say that it would. Again, it would just kind of be pointless um, because he's already talked to Mueller. And so it would kind of be a, you know, trying to get back at them type thing at this point or saying that, you know, knowing what he knows now, he never would have pleaded guilty, for example. But again, this this potential charge of a FARA violation is kind of hanging over this whole thing. So if he were to 
pull out of that plea agreement, there's always the possibility that he could be charged anew with something else. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll find out soon enough um, whether he's charged with something else or if, if the Senate grants him immunity or not. Uh, but we appreciate you coming on. Everyone, Atlantic staff writer and MSNBC contributor, Natasha Bertrand. Natasha, thanks again for joining us on Mueller, She Wrote. Thanks so much. You guys, always amazing reporting from Natasha Bertrand. Um, we highly recommend you follow her on Twitter and follow us if you get a chance at Mueller, She Wrote. We like you. <laughs> Smooth plug right there. <laughs> right? Just kind of slid it in. There you go. Uh, it's also Mueller, She Wrote uh, on Instagram. Oh, all Is right. An outlet big enough for that plug? I don't know if we have one. <laughs> wop wop. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, all right. Moving on to this past Monday. Finally, we're within this week. Nice. Reuters reported that Ecuador wants to end asylum for Julian Assange and hand him over to the U.S. Uh, we've been reporting on this for a while. I'm not sure what's new here. Uh, but this week, Assange spoke from the Ecuadorian embassy in London in a hearing for a suit he filed over living conditions in the embassy, saying Ecuador was not being cool to him because they required him to pay for his own medical bills and phone calls, and they required him to clean up after his own pet cat. Uh, Assange. I didn't know you could bring pets into asylum. I didn't know that the, the, your country had to pay for their care. Like, <laughs> come on, Ecuador, take care of checkers, you know. Aww. I don't know if it's checkers. He needs the crystals in the litter. <laughs> <laughs> I can't sleep with the cat piss. Uh, I don't know what his accent is. Um, But yeah, Assange has been in the Ecuadorian embassy in London for six years, avoiding extradition to Sweden for a sexual assault case and arresting Great Britain for violating his bail, which would result in him being handed over to the United States, extradited, where I'm sure there's a sealed indictment waiting for him uh, in Mueller's office or I I guess technically in in a court docket somewhere. Uh, Also Monday, there was a brief court filing changing the time of Andrew Miller's appeal hearing. It's still November 8th, but it's at 1 p.m. instead of 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Everybody tweeted, what's this? Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Like, they just backed it up um, till after lunch, I guess. Uh, Everybody wants to eat first. Uh, I think we're about to set our clocks back so everyone can stop emailing me that it's technically Eastern Daylight Time. Um, (laughs) I decided to stick with calling it Standard Time because I actually get more emails asking me what the D stands for than people who complain it's actually daylight time. Mm -hmm. So everyone, I just want you to know, I know what time it is. (laughs) Uh, Finally Monday in this week's installment of Beans Come True. A couple weeks ago, I had put beans on the fact that Trump was sharpening his crayons to answer Bob Mueller's collusion questions in writing, but that he would probably stall until after the elections. Jaleesa, can you roll that, roll those beans? Oh yeah. Roll that bean footage. (laughs) And, uh, Mueller just recently has been talking to Cohen, not to mention he's waiting for those written responses, you know, to his questions from Trump. I, 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 there's nothing stopping Trump from slow rolling those answers to those questions to buy time to fire everyone at the top of the DOJ so we can replace him with Brian Bunchkowski and Matthew fucking Whitaker. <laughs> so we call him Matthew fucking Whitaker. I love that. Um, <laughs> So these major aspects could be wrapped up by Thanksgiving, which cracks me up because remember last year when Trump's lawyers were demanding the probe be finished by Thanksgiving? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, they did, maybe they meant Thanksgiving 2018. Thing, yeah, yeah, maybe 2020. <laughs> Let's see. Well, guys, this week, Bloomberg reported that Giuliani said Monday that they were going to hold the answers until after the election. That's right. They're going to slow roll these answers. He's been quiet recently. Giuliani has been, if you're Giuliani. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't noticed, he's been real quiet. Um, and he has actually said that him and Mueller have an f- informal verbal agreement not to comment much during these negotiations. Oh, oh. shut the fuck uh-huh. up. Beans. Yeah. <laughs> so, him and Mueller have a verbal agreement to not comment on an ongoing investigation. Yeah. That's what he said? Yeah, thanks, buddy. Yeah. That's cool. I think everyone has that agreement with him. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, Mueller's not going to say a bunch of shit? Yeah. Okay. That's um, so uncharacteristic of him. But that Giuliani's quiet is interesting. That I, is uh, a shocker there. I, I, yeah. I, I, it's just like, oh, we have an understanding. Oh, fuck you. Yeah. Um, also this week, Don Jr. says he's worried Mueller is going to fabricate charges against him. Ugh. Mm. Typical move by guilty people. Oh, yeah. Um, I think someone should fabricate him a chin. He needs a chin. <laughs> uh, and this week in Trump supporters can't tech. Even the super young ones, apparently. Tuesday, a very serious but very hilariously poorly executed plot to smear Bob Mueller unraveled. Friend of the pod, Scott Stedman, apparently got an email from a fake person saying she was sexually harassed by Bob Mueller. And Stedman uh, was afraid Jacob Wall was going to come forward with a story when he tweeted that big news was going to come out about Bob Mueller and the Me Too movement. Mm, Stay tuned. Uh. (laughs) 
Uh, Jacob Wool is a 20 year old piece of shit con artist. He's he's he, <laughs> he's been banned from trading for life because of his shenanigans. He's barely lived. He, That's true. He was only he, been an adult for two years. He, yeah, apparently he, he he was illegal. He did a Ponzi scheme. He did a, a Bernie Madoff a, a few years ago when he was a kid. Oh, that's great. Uh, and he's been banned from mm-hmm. futures trading. His origin story was Herbalife. <laughs> for life. Started selling perfume on street corners. Uh, he and Jack Berkman, a conservative conspiracy theorist and friend of Trump. Uh, Berkman, incidentally, he's the guy that hosted that ridiculous fundraiser for Rick Gates' legal fees from that banquet room in the mm-hmm. Holiday Inn. Remember that? Mm-hmm. The one where Gates had to join via Skype because he was on house arrest. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like five people showed up and donated like seven dollars. Oh, uh, that's Jack Berkman. Okay, so him and this b- little piece of shit kid, Wool. He's got one of those punchable faces like Richard Spencer. Mm-hmm. He and Berkman <laughs> told Newsweek on Tuesday that they had spoken to five women who had credible accusations that Mueller sexually assaulted them. And then they held a press conference Thursday saying that they talked to all the women and one of them is legit. And uh, we're going to have a press conference with her with her. And then none of the accusers showed up at Burke and Berkman's fly was open the <laughs> whole time for the entire press conference. Apparently, emails were sent to women offering them money in exchange for saying Mueller assaulted them. Uh, one lady got offered. They paid. To, I'm sorry. They offered to pay off her entire credit card debt. And they knew exactly what her credit card debt was to the dollar which freaked her out, Mm -hmm. and an additional $20,000 if she would sign an affidavit saying that Mueller sexually assaulted her. And a company called Surefire Intelligence was connected to the bribery attempts. And it turns out Surefire Intelligence is registered to Jacob Wool. And the phone number listed, (laughs) reporters called it, apparently it goes to his mom's voicemail. (laughs) (laughs) And on LinkedIn, he created this whole Surefire Intelligence thing, and he set up... Uh, and as pictures of like the, the officers of the company, they have Christoph Waltz from Inglorious Bastards, some Indian model, uh, and along with Wool, his picture, claiming to be somebody else. <laughs> it's just the most ridiculous, dumb, oh, it's fucking dumb. And not only did the story flop, <laughs> but Peter Carr, spokesman for the special counsel's office, referred the entire thing to the FBI. So you might want to put Wool on your fantasy indictment team mm-hmm. this oh. week because that's bribery. Yeah, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. I want to submit. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, they could pay that $20,000 uh, bribe money towards their bill money, right? They could just <laughs> switch it on over. Yeah, they're yeah. going to have to. <laughs> Can you just imagine his mom getting that voicemail like, Jacob, <laughs> are you plotting the downfall of democracy again? <laughs> Jacob Wool? <laughs> I love it. The full name. You know you're Jacob in trouble. Jacob Patrick Wool. I may. I don't know what his middle name is. Yeah, well, some people are wondering where this money was going to come from, and they and they keep trying to make ties between the Trump uh, Trump circles and Berkman circles and there's connections but I mean I don't know that would be super conjecture and I don't want to get into it but um, that's definitely something that's going down it's such a weird story you guys crazy also Tuesday Trump started a campaign against birthright citizenship and joining us today to discuss the implications is host of his own TV and radio show please welcome David Pakman to Mueller she wrote David thanks for joining us thanks so much for having me so I've seen you tweeting a little bit, and I know you're working, I think you said you were working on a story about uh, wanting people's opinions about what's going on with the attack on birthright citizenship. Yeah, uh, I think there's a few interesting elements to this. I mean, the first one is, like with any of these uh, stories that sort of seems to pop out and then take over the media discussion for 24, 48, however many hours, I always am interested in thinking about is is the story distracting from other important stories? And that doesn't mean that these are planted distractions, but just sort of that they become de facto distraction sometimes from something maybe more pressing, like, for example, the midterm elections. But the other interesting story for me about the birthright citizenship um, uh, idea which is using an executive order to end something that at least appears to be, according to legal experts, codified by the 14th Amendment, is not so much is it legally possible, because that, that's, that's sort of one aspect to it, but if you don't have birthright citizenship, how do you determine who gets to be a citizen? And it might seem really obvious because those who favor getting rid of birthright citizenship for the most part do so because of the way they perceive birthright citizenship to be taken advantage of by undocumented immigrants. And they may imagine that if you just get rid of birthright citizenship, nothing else really changes other than undocumented immigrants can't come to the U.S. and 
have children who become citizens. But the reality is that it's far more complicated. And once you eliminate birthright as a path to citizenship at all, then you actually do have to sort of think about, well, what what becomes the law in terms of how one gets citizenship. And I'm already going back and forth with a bunch of people on Twitter and sort of spitballing ideas for a story I'll probably do on my show next week. Yeah, that's really interesting that you bring that up, David, because I, I feel like uh, when I first heard this story, it seemed completely preposterous to me that he would legally be able to do this. There would immediately be lawsuits filed by, like, let's say the AG of New York, Attorney General New York, uh, for one, who would uh, basically challenge the legality of, of an executive order like that. But more interestingly is when Obama used the power of the executive order to grant, um, you know, asylum for dreamers, uh, the the Republican Party flipped out and said he was going, he was abusing his power, abusing his executive power. And a lot of people tend to agree with that. Like, I think that some of these, uh, personally, I think some of these uh, executive powers should be dialed back. But to support that, but to... Uh, you know, or to oppose that executive order, but support this executive order kind of makes me questions that question their motivations. No doubt about it. And there's like a secondary hypocrisy angle as well, which is just in general. Uh, we all know that the folks that are defending the legality of using executive order to at least reinterpret constitutional amendments would, I'm sure, not be open to a president doing that when it comes to the Second Amendment, for example, or others. But the second is, is sort of the one that comes to mind to me. The stepping back from the specifics of birthright citizenship, um, imagine if President Obama had, had actually suggested or even said he was considering or drafting up uh, using an executive order to reinterpret any other amendment, but in particular the second, they, they would not have that at all. So the, there's a level of hypocrisy here, but there's also like a short-sightedness to it, um, uh, both for, for the reasons that you cite and also because it's not quite so simple if you eliminate birthright to determine in a way that um, even a lot of people on the right would be pleased with how you determine who is a citizen of the United States. Now, do you know, have you done any research as to whether or not Donald Trump himself or any of his children have, have benefited from birthright citizenship? Yeah, so this is actually a story that I don't know where it started. It might have started as a meme. I, I don't know exactly where I first saw it, but the argument basically was that some were making, hey, listen, Trump's first three kids, Eric, Don Jr., and Ivanka, benefited from the same birthright citizenship that Donald Trump is trying to get rid of because their mom, Ivana Trump, didn't become a citizen until until after they were born. And I've been very, very direct that every, we the left should abandon that story 100 percent. If your point is to show that Trump is a hypocrite on immigration, we can do that talking about Melania's parents and chain migration. We can do that and talk about Trump's hiring of undocumented workers uh, to to work on real estate projects. He's a Associated with, but this is a really um, uh, uh, sort of dumb story to get behind because no matter what the status of Ivana Trump uh, at the time that Eric Don Jr. and Ivanka were born, and of course she was a citizen, but she was here legally, their father was unquestionably a U.S. born legal citizen, and it simply is is not a good story for the left. And the, and the problem is that the way that politics works right now. As soon as the right successfully criticizes this argument that Eric Don Jr. and, and Ivanka benefited from birthright citizenship, the left is going to be attacked on all of their views when it comes to these, this issue, and there's going to be attempt to discredit the left. So it's, I don't think that that's fair, but I think that it makes sense to stay very far away from this Trump's kids benefited from birthright citizenship story. Yeah, I agree 100%. We, be, we then become... Uh, birthers the way Trump uh, had said that Obama was not a citizen uh, when his mother was in fact a full naturalized citizen um, and he was questioning her or uh, Obama's um, uh, citizenship so then we just become them absolutely and you know what if if it were actually accurate then we could say well it might sound like birtherism but it might be accurate but in this case it's not even accurate we shouldn't even be talking about it Right. And it's something that I support anyway. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I, sure. you know, sometimes we point out hypocrisies, um, but then the, the, the hypocrisies are, you know, we actually believe in those things. I'm all for 
uh, family reunification or chain migration. I'm all for birthright citizenship. Uh, also, is so is the Constitution. Not let's not forget that. But you know, I, you, it's just it makes us seem, you know, like we're going low when they go low. Totally agree. All right. Well, that is the birthright citizenship argument, and I I think. I think you're right. When I first heard this, I was like, this is, I don't know if distraction is the right word, but it's, an, it's just another pre-election talking point. I don't want to get wrapped up in this. It's completely illegal. He'll never succeed at it. But I know there are a lot of people out there who are, are worried that he could very well with now that he's, I guess, stacked the courts with conservatives, that he could very well make it happen. But I, I don't think he could without a constitutional amendment. He would need two thirds and it's, you know, all that um, we would have to have. Uh, a constitutional convention to even touch that. Yeah. And I think that there is another interesting story that the birthright citizenship idea relates to. And that's something I've been talking about for a while, which is the sort of signaling that we've seen from Donald Trump and from his administration to extremists and white nationalists and white supremacists. And the idea of, at this point, given the overtones of repealing birthright citizenship and and how we specifically are are sort of thinking about the migrant caravan, for example, and brown people from Central and South America. This is the imagery that sort of goes along with with the idea of repealing birthright citizenship. Um, This is part of the signal package, I guess is what I would call it, that has really coalesced and catalyzed the neo-Nazis and the other extremists. And there's a very long list of these signals. Obviously, saying there's fine people on both sides of a neo-Nazi rally and counter-protest was one of those really, really clear signs. But there's a lot of others. Uh, There's, you know, from the campaign, we've got to shut down all Muslim immigration until we figure out what the hell is going on. I am a nationalist last week or the week before. The idea of we don't want people from s-hole countries but what about people from norway coming to the united states sending the military to the border to stop latino asylum seekers so there's often these defenses of well his son-in-law is jewish and his grandkids are jewish so therefore something but these are really clear signals and uh, I spoke personally to Richard Spencer of one of the more prominent white nationalists in the world right now he said he reads the signals from Trump on this issue Derek Black is a former KKK member he was recently interviewed and he said I was part of this group and these are signals that my former uh, cohort is going to hear and think about very very favorably so regardless of what's in Trump's mind the more important thing is that the extremists are hearing the signals. Wow. Yeah, that's that's a really amazing point. Um, David, I really appreciate you coming on uh, today. Can you tell uh, our listeners where they can find you and where they can watch your show? Yeah, the best place is just davidpackman.com. We're on a couple hundred radio and TV stations and on DirecTV and Dish, and we've got a podcast and a YouTube channel. But the, the central hub for it all is my website, davidpackman.com. All right. Thanks. You guys heard it. Go check out davidpackman.com. David, really, thank you so much for coming on Mueller She Wrote. Thank you so much for having me. All right. On to Wednesday. Halloween. Spooky. (laughs) Uh, Watergate historians and Mueller junkies alike got a treat uh, in the form of an historic document unsealed from the Nixon grand jury. For the first time ever, we are seeing the roadmap the grand jury took during the Watergate investigation. As it turns out, we've all been speculating that eventually Mueller would hand a report over to Congress, but we didn't know, we didn't really have a precedent outlining the method for doing that until now. Uh, normally, grand jury hearings are kept secret forever. Um, the, the, the secrecy of the grand jury is sacrosanct. It's very important. It's like, it's sacred. Um, but uh, those hearings, are, could, they're used to determine if someone is going to be indicted or not. But under Nixon, a judge decided that in this unpre- or that unprecedented situation, they would allow the grand jury evidence to be sent to Congress. In Nixon's case, the grand jury had enough evidence to bring four criminal charges against Nixon. But rather than indict him, a judge decided the best thing to do was to hand that evidence over to the House Judiciary Committee. House Judiciary Committee. Um, that is what led to Nixon's resignation. We all kind of were assuming that they were going to impeach him mm-hmm. and that somebody went to Nixon and said, we got enough to impeach you, and that's why he resigned. That's what I thought, too. He was, gonna res- he was resigning because he was... Uh, culpable for four indictments um, from the grand jury. And now we have the roadmap for how that information gets to Congress. There's a precedent set, right? And um, 
you know, uh, Nixon was facing those four indictments. But like I said, what's important here is this gives Mueller a legal precedent for what to do with his findings once he has them from the grand jury. And now he has the framework to send those findings to the House, the House Judiciary Committee. So Mueller has two paths, something like the Starr report from Kenneth Starr, which was awkward and conclusory, or what Special Prosecutor Jaworski did during Watergate, which is a facts and evidence based report given to the House. And now there's precedent on, on that is how you get it done. Uh, even if the grand jury's information is supposed to be secretive, there is now precedent saying it's not in these cases. That's so, amazing. Mueller can now cite the Watergate document uh, when he presents his findings. In this case, the federal judge says the grand jury secrecy rules give way to the Congress's need to know. And this is important to Mueller because this is going to be the same federal court as the Watergate grand, ju- the Watergate grand jury. <laughs> the House Judiciary is controlled by the Republicans. Elections are two days away. Vote accordingly. Yeah. <laughs> what I don't know is if both parties in the House get the report or just the majority. That's a good mm. question. I think I would think both. I would think the chair and the ranking would get it or the gang of eight. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but the, this specific document from Watergate says that it was given to the House Judiciary Committee. Mm. So I don't know if it's given to the majority chair yes. or the majority chair and the ranking member. Yeah. Okay. But it's the House of Representatives that we have a chance to take back. Right. I was going to say, thank God that that's going to happen after the elections. Mm-hmm. And also, Well, you have to remember, they don't get the gavels back till January 1st. Mm-hmm. But they'll get to plan. So there's that two, two month no man's land where if Mueller hands that report over, does just Nunez get it? God. Or does Nunez and Schiff get it? That's a yeah. very good point. Or is that the House Intel Committee? And how soon could they make it public the way they did? Anyway, with this the Republican one? and the Democrat. Right. Well, Nunez and Schiff are in the same committee. Is right, but is that is? the House Intel Committee or is that the House Judiciary Committee? I think it's the House Judiciary Committee. Okay, well, we can look it up. Yeah. But either way, I'm just wondering if it's just the Republican who gets it right uh, after the elections or if the Republican and the Democrat get it, the majority and the minority. The yeah, ranking. that oh, makes wait, sense. This Watergate thing to the report um, is just coming out now, right, to the public? Yeah, we haven't seen it years. in 44 years. So if it does go to, um, to Nunes, you know, and he tries to keep it private, it, it could still come out to the public, you know, just a matter of like how quickly, right? Like it could, they can release it to us if they release it to him. It's up to him. Um, wow. But I'm still checking to see if Nunez is the judiciary chair. It is not. It's oh, intelligence. Okay. Who's the judiciary chair again? I should know this off the top of my head. I'm sorry. There's so many people, AG. <laughs> there, there, there are. Is it Goodlatte? No. I should know this It's a too. name we're all not going to guess too, probably. Um... Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I look at the chairman, the chairman. Bob serves as chairman of the House Judiciary <laughs> Committee. <laughs> uh, wait. B- oh, yeah. Bob Goodlatte. It is Goodlatte. Okay, Goodlatte. Right, Goodlatte. Right, Goodlatte. Right. Good, good. Good. I, I got it. it right. Thank God. <laughs> Goodlatte. <laughs> <laughs> My reputation remains intact. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> good old Bob. Who is the ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee? I think... Do, 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 and is good luck a do. good guy? Or are we good lat? No. Good, oh, in that case, we're back to square one there. Yeah, you can see his um, douchery in all of the hearings that were. Uh, what was what was his best showing? <laughs> when was he most infuriating? <laughs> his best I, yeah, greatest <laughs> hits. I think it's Nadler, who's the House Judiciary, the New York rep, the rep from New York. Is it? Let's see. <clears throat> the ranking. Jerry Nadler, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do, do, do. Okay. <laughs> we did it. So Uh-oh. does we'll just. never forget again. <laughs> so does just Goodlatte get it or does Nadler and Goodlatte get it? Because the Democrats don't take over until January 1st. If if we flip the house. Yeah. Vote. You have to vote. So ideally, or none of that matters. Right. This right. Is, this is a question. Sorry. Go ahead. Julie. No, I was just going to say, ideally, Mueller would would. Yeah, actually, I forgot what I was going to say. You can go ahead. Oh, man. <laughs> it's, it just lost me like half a second ago. Sorry. I was, this is a question we can find out the answer to, right? Or no? Do we have to see that roadmap to, to know where it goes? I think I just need to look at the report. It mm-hmm. might be in there. It might not be in there. Uh, it just might be that the, the judge said it could go to the House Judiciary Committee. I assume it would go to the to the chair and the ranking member. Yeah. That'd be kind of fucked up. <laughs> like only, would, only the majority, only the gets, majority to see gets to see important things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and if Nadler gets it, I'm sure we'll get it. Okay. So, it came back to me, by the at way. At least parts just, of it. I was thinking I Ideally, we would want Mueller to drop his report after, like, January, right? That's mm-hmm. That would be best, right? Okay, but we're um, suspecting he's doing it sooner. I think he's going to do it sooner, and I'm hoping that this roadmap, that they give it to the House Judiciary, I'm hoping that the ranking member gets it as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's I not guess. just good lot. Got it. Because of that guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then, 
the it would be less squashed if the house had taken uh or dems had taken the house and then it gets you know yeah and i'm not sure you know why you wouldn't be able to bring it up again after january 1st it's not like um it's, you, you you get it and then it's yeah. it self-destructs and you're <laughs> n- not allowed to remember anything that was in it trump oh. wishes <laughs> so, yeah i don't know we'll see though uh thursday we learned aaron banks and elizabeth bilney and other unnamed individuals of leave.eu and brexit fame were criminally referred to the national crime agency and they are now officially investigating leave eu and better for the country or bftc over suspected electoral law offenses this is about time This comes on the tale of Bannon testifying to the grand jury, and he's connected to Cambridge Analytica, which in turn is connected to Brexit, which in turn comes from on the heels of Manafort's cooperation agreement. Manafort cooperates, and then we got Bannon, Corsi, Corsi, Bannon, you know, coming in to testify. They did it twice. I wasn't just repeating their names. (laughs) Um, And they're connected to Cambridge Analytica, which is connected to Brexit. And I I think that that's maybe what is prompting this Aaron Banks uh, and Elizabeth Bilney and other unnamed people persons. Um, Aaron Banks says he's innocent, uh, and this is conjecture, but if Nigel Farage is not one of those unnamed people, I think his criminal referral isn't far behind. Mm, definitely. Thanks to our friends across the pond. Yay. <sighs> you guys are in it just like we are. Also on Thursday, the New York Times did a piece asking where the Russians are this midterm. According to the report, the National Security Agency has now taken to sending messages directly to Russian hackers, reminding them that they're being watched. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's their defense. We can see you. The Robert De Niro little, like, finger, <laughs> yeah. I think. <laughs> the two fingers in the eye. How do you describe that gesture? It's <laughs> an e-card. Got there you my go. eye on you. <laughs> uh, still, others say that the Russians are too smart to run the same con twice. Uh, some experts believe Russia is sitting this one out. Uh, and this worries people because they could be waiting until the last moment to act. You don't, you, who knows? But the Russians haven't exactly gone away. We've seen a few pre-election intrusions, like with Senator mm-hmm. McCaskill. Jaleesa, you've been telling us, giving us updates on midterm hacks. And we had that recent indictment of that Russian agent acting as a treasurer for a Russian agency. Not to mention Maria Butina. We've had that uh, whole situation oh, come yeah. up. So. And speaking of Butina, the Senate has asked the NRA to hand over all the documents from their trip to Russia in 2015 when Torshin's group, the Right to Bear Arms, organized an NRA delegation to go to Moscow for a week where they met with former Deputy Prime Minister Rogozin, former NRA president and soon-to-be president David Keene and Peter Brown, uh, Brownell. Uh, they were both on the trip, along with Milwaukee Sheriff David Clark with all the flair, 15 pieces of flair on his uniform, NRA donors Gregory and the Goldschlagers, and uh, Jim Libertori, the president of the Outdoor Channel. Remember when we talked about that guy? So they, the Senate's like, give it, give it. We I need want, to see all your documents. And what, what could they find? Because I would imagine those guys would like try to destroy anything that would be like how do, what do they fuckery? Do? Yeah, just travel itineraries. And or or you know there might be a, might have been communications with the Russians about how about Butina maybe Torshin about how to infiltrate yeah. <clears throat> or make donations. You remember the thirty million dollars that the mm-hmm. NRA gave to okay gave to Trump from probably Russia um, uh, and just that kind of information because the Treasury's been asking for a while now to hand over you know all of the money all your donation information yeah, been, yeah. we've been you know they've been asking them for that uh senator warner i know mark warner and a couple other senators on the senate intel committee have also been demanding that they hand over their donations their money their dues like wh- sh- show us where you got 30 million dollars exactly basically. a receipt <laughs> yeah yeah like where'd you get this shit and they're like well we have some russian people it's like two thousand dollars and they're mm-hmm. like yeah come on okay now where's the other twenty nine million nine hundred and ninety eight thousand? exactly so <laughs> that's yeah. kind of this kind of goes along the lines of this. They're just ke- they just keep demanding shit from mm-hmm. from the NRA. So interesting. We'll see. Put yeah. some beans on it. Then finally on Friday, the Citizens for Responsible Ethics in Washington, also known as Crew, got a hold of a waiver that was written back in April and signed by Don McGahn that allows Noel Francisco to preside over cases that um, Jones Day, the law firm, might be involved in because that's the one that's representing Trump in the Russia investigation. So, uh, and Noel Francisco used to work for Jones Day, so apparently, and we didn't know this until this whole waiver came out, he wouldn't be able to oversee the Russia investigation. So if Rosenstein and Sessions got fired, he wouldn't be able to take over uh, the Russia investigation because he worked for Jones Day, which is representing Trump. He'd have to recuse himself. But this waiver gives him the ability to stay on and oversee that. It gives him, it waives that ethics rule and uh, allows him to not have to recuse himself. And a lot of people are like, oh my God, this is terrible. But I actually think this is good because, um, you know, we've been sort of hoping 
that Noel Francisco would take over if Rosenstein and Sessions were fired because he's not Benchkowski. He's not uh, Matthew fucking Whitaker, right? He's just, he's the Solicitor General. And you, if you remember, we did a story about how they did this public appearance. They all had a dinner together. Rosenstein, Sessions, and Noel Francisco publicly appeared so that everyone would see them together, um, supposedly making sort of a public statement that they're all on the same page. Um, and they did that at the end of February. And then, bam, a little over a month later, he gets this waiver. So that's important to note um, because, like I said, right after the election, um, presumably Wednesday, uh, everyone's saying that uh, Trump's going to have a fire sale and basically clean house in the DOJ. And this waiver would allow Noel Francisco to oversee the Russia investigation. But it was signed by Don McGahn and it was back in April. So I don't know kind of what the implications are, but I know that there's really no better choice in, as, as far as I can see. Uh, it would be nice to have somebody that doesn't have any um, conflicts of interest, but uh, I, I don't know that that <laughs> exists in the Trump White House. So anyway, you guys, that that's one of those things that, you know, we'll just see how time will tell. Uh, we'll, we'll probably know this week. So anyway, we'll be right back. Hey, Muller junkies. I want to take a minute to tell you about stamps.com, where you can access all the services of the post office right from your desk. They send you a digital scale so you can print the exact amount of postage, which saves a ton of money. And you can print real postage for any package or letter 24-7 so you don't have to leave work early and you're not chained to the post office hours. We use stamps.com to send out all of our patron swag. And I remember spending like an hour at the post office because we have so much of it where, you know, we manually had to enter every address with the post office post office worker. And those people are so awesome. But like, it was just a lot of time out of our day to go down there. And then we had to buy stamps and we were we're always using extra postage and wasting money, but with stamps.com, we just import the file, print the labels with the postage right on them. So it's the exact postage. We save a ton of money. Done and done. So head to stamps.com and use the code AG for a very special offer. You're going to get a four-week trial, and they will send you a digital scale, so you will never overpay for postage again. Head to stamps.com, and the first thing you need to do is click that little radio microphone and then enter AG. So that's stamps.com and enter AG. You'll be glad you did. All right, welcome back. Hot notes. All right, you guys, this week we have some really, really intense reporting. Uh, amazing reporting from both of you. Aw, thanks. It's, it's not, we have some amazing reporting from Jordan, but first, let's get this Jaleesa crap out of the way. <laughs> this is kind of how I, how I unintentionally made it sound last week. <laughs> it's all good. It's all amazing. It's all bigly, fantastic, <laughs> mm-hmm. tremendous reporting. And I know he said big league, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> never mind. That would give away my identity. Um, <clears throat> moving right along, uh, Jordan, you have some stuff on on Roger Stone today. Stonehenge, big news in the Stonehenge world. But so Julissa, I know. But Julissa, you have some really kind of shocking yet not shocking at all reporting yeah. from uh, Emily Jane Fox at Vanity Fair on, on Cohen some stuff that Cohen says so what, what do you got absolutely I think it's it's not shocking in the context but from the person it's coming from it's interesting so this week in a uh, racist see the darndest things Michael <laughs> Co- <laughs> Michael Cohen he shines more light on Trump's racist past and present specifically Cohen recalled a conversation at Trump Tower where he told Trump that one of his rallies looked a little vanilla on TV to which Trump responded that's because black people are too stupid to vote for me (laughs) then cohen said that uh following nelson mandela's passing trump told him name one country run by a black person that's not a shithole um the united states 2008 (laughs) to 2016 oh yeah we'll we'll break this down (laughs) not to mention (laughs) you're like oh i got some i got some examples i'm just getting bullet points right now uh (laughs) not to mention cohen also recalled a conversation with trump from a few years back while they were traveling through chicago and he said that as they drove through a rougher neighborhood trump turned to cohen and said only the blacks could live like this. And there were other quotes. Uh, those stuck out the most. So just to unpack that for a bit, the black people are too stupid to vote for Trump comment is ridiculous. Uh, but I have a theory that maybe Trump actually means that black people are, are dumb to vote for Democrats because he's like, they don't care about you either. But that's just another unfair generalization by Trump. I feel like obviously there are plenty of Democratic candidates who care about black people like Andrew Gillum, who Trump recently called a thief, or Stacey Abrams that Trump called unqualified, or even Maxine Walters, who Trump says has a low IQ. 
So, of course, Trump has no evidence to back up any of these claims. I bet he just thinks he doesn't even need any because all of these targets are black. He basically is just relying on America's racism to satisfy his assertions. And Andrew Gillum, I think, said it perfectly. He said it's not that he's saying Trump is a racist, but simply that racist thinks he's a racist, like you were saying, A.G. So it's all in the language. And as far as the other remarks, only the blacks could live like this or name one country run by a black person. It's not a shithole. I feel like even if you can't name one, you know, or a city that probably speaks more to your ignorance of geography than this, you know, than, than basically the history of racism as a whole. I feel like black and brown people have been oppressed across the whole planet. And so it's not just here. If anyone thinks that black neighborhoods are ghetto because of just black people alone, they're just ignorant of the nation's history or the history of racism in their country. And I feel like there's centuries long consequences to slavery. There's real barricades. And we all know this here, but it's just Trump using this as like a way to just rally up races with stereotypes instead of focusing on the facts. And um, basically Trump has never had to understand these things. So maybe there's a part of it that is ignorance for him and not just fear mongering um but i just i think it's awful i mean i can't even it's it's the fact that he feels like black people are just down because of their own merit and not because of resources or the fact that you know his life turned out the way it is because he is a white straight male and he was born into wealth and i don't think he actually sees the difference there i think a part of him may actually be racist well, he's yeah. got he's got a history of specifically when he's talking about black people calling them stupid and thieves oh, at totally. low IQ. That's yeah. his, that's kind of the same theme. Yeah, he's, yeah, and that's criminals and that's why the, these comments to me weren't surprising. They're horrible and they're awful, but that it goes with his pattern of, of referring to African Americans, black people, people of color as low IQ. Yeah, um, and then you can go all the way back to the to the um, Central Park Five with. Uh, and the fact that his father was um, trying to keep black kick, kick black people out of um, their, their apartments. Their yeah. apartments. Th- he's got a long history of this. Absolutely. And that's why so it we, wasn't surprising. We know to me. Trump is racist, yeah, and we know he doesn't care about his racist comments. But the, you know, the question is, why is Cohen telling us this all now? Like you were saying, Ag, I think I feel like maybe it's because the midterms are coming up. Obviously, he wants to clear his conscience, or because he's awaiting sentencing and he wants to clean up his act. And uh, either way, I know that Cohen's not the most, you know, justice guy, as we put it in the live show. But I, I do think that he's trying to do the right thing for whatever personal reasons. And uh, Cohen is the son of a Holocaust survivor, you know. So like, maybe after the attack on Pittsburgh with the 11 Jewish people that were killed, he was just like, I can't do this. He even tweeted about um, the incident. He said, in honor of those sadly being bur- buried today resulting from anti-Semitism, let's follow the wisdom and thoughtful works of Rabbi Jeffrey Myers. It can't just be to say we need to stop hate. We need to do, we need to act to tone down rhetoric. So, I mean, that pretty much explains his argument there. But he just sat through it all those years. you know. Yeah, it, 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 during the uh, uh, campaign specifically, I, you know, because all these comments are from before and mm-hmm. i think the most yeah. recent one was from the campaign and then yeah the, the comments about the people on the trail like you were saying gillum calling him a thief all those were like what, last week you know right so, but those are his public statements exactly the quotes the private ones are yeah. like years ago some of them yeah and and i you know it's like well, you'd be stuck with him but that you know that could have just been greed and that's just the kind of guy cohen is yeah mm-hmm. yeah he said he got so used to the environment that at first he felt uncomfortable but he just you know toughed it up for his job and i get that but god that sucks yeah and now Trump has the audacity to say shit like black unemployment's the lowest it's ever been and black voters love him and all this stuff. That right, be right. the furthest thing from the truth. The my African-American comment, that one sticks with me a lot too when he was pointing out the one black person in the crowd. He doesn't even know the right re- like language to use because he's so used to seeing us as things. He's like, that's my African-American. It's like, just call him a person. I know you're not the most you know non-racist person, but like just try not to sound as racist. But I don't think that's his goal. His goal is to stir up that kind of, you know, he wants people to think like him. Yeah, it's it's dog whistle speak to to white nationalist base it's the yeah. only base that he's got left that's 100 percent behind him julissa can i ask you a question please and Hell please yeah. don't take it as being tokenizing oh at dude all. no it go just, for it i was just watching a uh, trump rally and he alluded to he was like black people love me and then and then it like turns to a black woman who's holding a sign and she just gets so lit up <laughs> by him saying this yeah. it makes her feel like so good obviously yeah yeah and I'm and I'm I'm wondering like when you when you see that as a black woman like what what are your what are your thoughts like what's your initial reaction to that I hope that's okay what would for make me somebody act that way yeah, yeah yeah I mean I I definitely know black people that talk uh 
poorly about other black people in a racist sense, like they are self internalized with their hatred. Um, growing up, I suffer with that. I think a lot of people like to be the one black person that white people um, are like, oh, you're cool. You're one of the cool ones. Like we accept you and everyone else can, you know, <laughs> go to hell. So maybe she felt like, oh, I'm it's like a status thing, you know, like growing up, I struggled with with just the idea of whiteness being, you know, the best thing. And so someone like that, I mean, she could actually agree and align with his policies. But then if, if that's not the case, if there's something else going on, because to me, it's like her policies or his policies wouldn't help a black person per se. So she must just feel this connection, you know, to to the idea that she is a part of this thing, even if her role is just the token. She's like, I made it, you know? Like, the idea of being with, like, a white person sometimes, like, I subconsciously, I didn't realize it, but you would think, like, if there's a status connected to it in this country, and it goes into anything, relationships, you know, being that person at the rally. It, it sucks, but it's real. Yeah. Thank you uh, for answering that. Thanks for the question. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah thanks for the reporting on that. That's, um, again, that's Emily Jane Fox, I think, from Vanity Fair. Put yeah. That, put out that story. Um, and, boh, man, this was not a quiet week like I thought it was going to be. No way. Uh, Jordan, what do you got on the Stonemeister? Yeah, so, <laughs> Stonemeister. Um, <laughs> Jack Frost. What is he, what, what character is he from those animated claymation evil villain I things. I can't even I remember. Forget. Yeah, whatever. He's one of Nixon. them. Nixon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, for the first time in honor of doing these hot notes, started watching the documentary Get Me Roger Stone oh. on yeah. Netflix. Yeah. Have you seen it? Yeah. Dude. Good? Dude. Yeah. Well, good for but like... But he's a... Like, the. I just didn't realize what a definition of a fucking troll he is. Oh, yeah. He. Do you know what he did? Okay, Julius, he did this one time. He got... He was working for a campaign... And he went to a Democrat or no, it was a it was a Republican candidate that was running against a Republican candidate. He was helping, I think. Mm -hmm. And he took a jar of coins and then brought it to them and got a receipt from that. He said he was with the American Socialist Party or something. OK. And he goes there and makes them give him a receipt that so it says on record that they took money from the American Socialist Organization. Wow. And just a, a jar of coins, you said? Yeah. Okay. All right. What a piece of shit. Interesting. What a fucking piece of shit. And he doesn't. Oh my god, he he's such a troll. Kind of stuff too. Yeah. Oh, one hundred percent. Well, Nixon had four indictments that we just learned about, and uh, he's his hero, so maybe he'll get four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he can be just like his hero. Yeah, you get to see his Nixon shrine at his house in the movie oh, too. Oh gosh. Pretty, yeah, it's weird, it's right? Absurd. It's crazy. Um. Yeah. Wait, uh, he does have a shrine guy. in his house? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. He has yeah. a whole room that's just it's. <laughs> It's like 80% Nixon, 10% Reagan. <laughs> it's like a and really like, weird um, Day of the Dead. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like that paints this, a picture. <laughs> this, is a, this is a weird ver personal version of Coco, man. This is yeah, really it's messed crazy. up. <laughs> and he like he just loves people to hate on him, so he's letting yeah. these people film him. And then his mother, who's like 90-something, lives with him. And he's like, Mom, these are liberal filmmakers. Don't trust anything they say. Don't wow. tell don't tell He lives them with his mom? Or his, I mean, mom his lives mom with lives with him. him. Oh, I guess Aww. at that age, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway. I'm going to just say he lives with his mom. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, Even though that's probably the nicest thing that he does for anyone is, is true. how's his mother. Yeah. Was someone in the movie was talking about how they have to get, they don't even like talking to him because he's so charming that you can you can sort of fall into his charm <laughs> and then you you quickly forget what a fucking troll he is <laughs> his house is under a bridge actually <laughs> just kidding <laughs> um, all right so <laughs> so this week downtown yeah <laughs> uh, under a bridge downtown yes um, i don't ever want to <laughs> Sorry, I hate that song. Continue. Continue. Chili peppers into this. <laughs> and their socks, their wiener socks. <laughs> all right, so here we go. <clears throat> Bunch of different stories came out. I'm sure you've seen it all trickling out, but the Mueller team is really starting to focus on Stone a lot, lot, lot. Uh, Mueller's team this week obtained new evidence suggesting that the right wing conspiracy theorist Jerome Corsi, AG was talking about him before, may have had advanced knowledge of HRC's emails uh, or the emails that were damaging to HRC's campaign. Uh, had knowledge that they were stolen and given to WikiLeaks. So it's being reported that some of these messages that exist apparently indicate that Stone and Corsi actually took credit for the emails release. Jerome Corsi is known as the founder of the birther movement, fun fact, so he's a real piece of shit. Uh, Corsi was subpoenaed in September and he turned over his computer, his phone, and his email records, but whenever he's been questioned about the timing of the release of the emails, Corsi said that he just had figured it out on his own that the Podesta emails must be coming and they must have been being saved for a quote, an October surprise. And Stone says that Corsi never told him before the leaks became public that they were coming. So, 
I think it's uh well we'll wait for a fantasy indictment leak, but but that's that's one small headline. Another one, just going a little bit more into a uh, Mueller's intentions with um, Roger Stone's inter- or his investigation into Roger Stone's interactions with the Trump campaign officials and the timing of the WikiLeaks release of the Podesta emails. Uh, so just a couple more, you know, facts have come out about that. So Mueller's looking more and more at Roger Stone's potential knowledge of the hacked information that was damaging to HRC's campaign and obtained and peddled by Russia and WikiLeaks. Mueller's team is seemingly focused on if Stone and the Trump campaign were working in coordination with WikiLeaks at all during these endeavors, including the timing, like I said, of the release of these emails. So the timing is so suspect because, if you'll remember, when the grabbing by the pussy tape came out, uh, less than an hour after that is when all of the or the first batch of the Podesta emails dropped. So people are wondering, okay, was that coordinated? That yeah, had, yeah. that's that's like I think that's really what's at the crux of Mueller's investigation into mm-hmm. Stone currently, among other branches. Uh, last Friday, we learned that the Mueller team questioned Bannon about what Stone told him regarding his connections with WikiLeaks before the release of those emails. Mm-hmm. When he was asked about what was said at this questioning, Bannon said that the prosecution has been very professional and courteous and that out of respect to them, he will not be talking publicly about what was discussed at that point in time. (laughs) Out of respect, gag order. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Not be gag order. Talking about anything, gag order. (laughs) Yeah, to Giuliani, it's because they have an agreement and to to Bannon, it's because he's just such a nice guy. They all have their Mm -hmm. reasons for for not talking about an ongoing investigation. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Bannon did, however, say to not believe everything you read because he just had to slip some crazy shit in there because he's a mouth shitter. <laughs> <laughs> he just has to say some crazy shit. Um, we also know now that multiple Stone associates have been subpoenaed and testified before a grand jury, including Randy Credico and the right wing nut job Jerome Corsi that we were just talking about. Randy Credico, we've talked about him a few times before. He's that New York-based comedian who is a huge Julian Assange fan. And they're basically, uh, the the question is whether or not he was the go-between between Stone and WikiLeaks. He says that he was not. Stone says that he was. (laughs) Uh, Investigators are particularly looking at that timing of the emails, like I said, um, in relation to the grab by the pussy tapes. And this week, Stone has been strongly denying having any knowledge of the Podesta emails. And he said that he played no role in the timing of the release of those emails. He did say, I may have discussed it with Manafort at a time, but <laughs> only after Manafort left the campaign. And he said anything that he said about WikiLeaks publicly was merely to generate publicity for, the Trumps, uh, for Trump's campaign. So... Troll. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also mm-hmm. criminal, though. Criminal yes. troll. Criminal troll. Uh, just a reminder, let's not forget, on August 2016, Stone boasted on Twitter, quote, I actually have communicated with Assange. Then on August 21st, he tweeted, trust me, it will soon be the Podesta's time in the barrel. Yep. But now he says that <clears throat> this info was just stuff that he got from Corsi. What barrel? Uh, yeah, I don't know what that tweet means, honestly. It's like typoed as fuck. But yeah, I time mean, in the barrel, like like a barrel of fish, or like a gun a barrel, barrel of fish. or like a barrel of suspenders that you wear going down Niagara Falls. Like what kind of barrel? <laughs> oh, I never think about those barrels. Yeah, <laughs> those are old school barrels. <laughs> those are old school barrels. Yeah. We've had a lot more modern barrels. Yeah, we have. All right, thank <laughs> you for uh, sticking with me. I have some a couple more exciting hat notes on him, and then I will pass it back to Ag. <laughs> uh, okay, so the next story that came out, Mueller apparently has recordings of Roger Stone bragging about stolen Democrat emails. Mueller's team has multiple recordings in which Stone brags about his knowledge of stolen Democrat emails on conference calls, identifying himself as quote the ultimate political insider. The fact that Mueller has subpoenaed these conference calls is a direct tip uh, that his team is looking super closely at Stone's contacts with WikiLeaks and whether he or other members of the Trump campaign coordinated with WikiLeaks slash Russia to damage HRC's campaign. So that's a pretty big revelation to know they've actually subpoenaed those conference calls. <laughs> if you're going to break the law, don't have conference calls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a stupid... Let me, yeah, just that big star in the middle of the table just broadcasting <laughs> it out to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the ultimate political insider. <laughs> Every <laughs> single conference call I'm on, it's like, this is, conference call is being recorded. If you do not agree <laughs> to being recorded, don't get on the conference call. Thank oh you. Oh, God, that's so funny. That's so <clears throat> true. They're all, right. all recorded. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Another another medium of trollery that has come out are some text messages trollery. that show that Roger Stone uh, has actually been working to try to get a pardon for Julian Assange. 
So he sent some messages to Credico, who we talked about before, uh, who Stone claims, as I said earlier, is the go-between between him and WikiLeaks, uh, Credico denies this. Urging for this could be seen by prosecutors as an attempt to undermine the Russia probe and conspiracy to obstruct justice. So if he's trying to say that Assange should get a pardon, a presidential pardon, and at the same time he potentially coordinated the release of the emails and was working with WikiLeaks, and then he's also advocating, you know, for him to get that pardon, that could be, that's where the obstruction of justice piece really comes in. Um, Credico has said that Stone claimed he was even working with a Fox News personality, Andrew Napolitano, to float the idea of a presidential pardon on his show. Napolitano denies this. Stone does not deny that he advocated for a presidential pardon for Assange. He also says that he definitely did urge Napolitano to do so as well. (laughs) So he's just really doubling down on this. And finally... Um, newly revealed emails show how Stone was advertising himself to Trump campaign advertisers as a potential go-between to WikiLeaks, um, who had hacked the emails that were damaging to Clinton. A little refresher, uh, what is ultimately unclear still is how much the Trump campaign knew about the hacked materials or their interactions with far-right operatives to disseminate this information. So that's what's really being looked at as well. Well, the New York Times released some Stone emails that very explicitly outlined some of these contacts and his attempts to secure financial backing to continue to engage in a campaign to damage Hillary Clinton. Uh, one, of these cam- one of these emails happened on the night of October 3rd, 2016, and it was an email exchange between Stone and Matthew Boyle, who is Breitbart's Washington editor. Uh, this was the day before Assange was set to have a press conference regarding the release of a new set of documents. The exchange reads... Assange. This is from uh, Boyle to Stone. Boyle says, Assange, what's he got? Hope it's good. So this is proof that Breitbart saw Stone as a credible link from the Trump campaign to WikiLeaks. Uh, Stone then responds saying, quote, it is. I tell Bannon, but he doesn't call me back. (laughs) What a troll love story. Uh, Then Boyle, Boyle then forwards the email to Bannon saying, call Stone, but don't say this came from me. So it gets forwarded. Then Bannon says, I've got important stuff to worry about. And <laughs> just brushes it off. To which Boyle responds, well, he clearly knows what Assange has. I'd say that's important. So that's just one of the emails that is tipping off that there's clearly an understanding that Stone has information that other people do not have regarding what WikiLeaks was up to. Yeah, and Bannon just testified. and On Friday, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it might be that Bannon could be a link directly to Trump about this or it could be Bannon didn't talk to Stone and Stone found another way to talk to Trump but all of this is really just coming out from the Manafort cooperation agreement and a lot of it's going to have to do with Cambridge Analytica a lot of it's going to have to do with uh, WikiLeaks and Stone it's going to be really interesting in the next couple weeks to see what comes out after the election yeah very excited Woo, that was long. Sorry. No it's cool man I was rushing through that a lot of reading a lot of Stone stuff Uh, so anyway uh, all right as I mentioned earlier in the show, Politico reported on October 24th that the special counsel appears to be locked in a sealed grand jury subpoena battle other than Andrew Miller's. If you remember, Andrew Miller, one of Roger Stone's associates, held himself in contempt so he could appeal his grand jury subpoena and fight the constitutionality of the Mueller appointment. Those arguments will be heard in open court on November 8th at 1 p.m., not 9.30. However... Uh, A Politico reporter staking out the court and noticing someone uh, picking up documents in a case involving an unknown person subpoenaed to the Mueller grand jury and a separate round of arguments from this case has been scheduled for December 14th. So this is a whole second thing. And we found this out because that Politico reporter was there when somebody came and tried to pick up these filings. The case went to the U.S. District Court Judge Beryl Howell to the D.C. Court of Appeals, and then back down to Howell, and then back up to the D.C. Court of Appeals again. The documents don't mention Mueller, but the Politico reporter witnessed the guy request a copy of the special counsel's latest sealed filings so the man's law firm could craft a response. The guy would not identify himself, and when the reporter uh, said, here's my card, let me know, he's like, no, I'm good. Uh, Another clue that it has to do with the Mueller case is that the first appeal was rejected as premature, and when the witness's lawyer asked the full bench of the court to review the decision, there was a notation showing only nine of the ten judges participated because Judge Greg Katsas had recused himself, Mm -hmm. and Greg Katsas is the only member of the panel that was appointed by Trump. And during his confirmation hearing, he said he would likely recuse himself from anything pertaining to the Russia investigation. He would err on the side of, you know, Mm -hmm. basically, I'll just recuse. 
So after this news dropped, I tweeted a thread that I thought the mystery witness was Randy Credico. And I did this based on Credico's resistance to testify in the first place. But Credico has already spoken to the grand jury for a couple of hours. Remember he brought his dog? <laughs> uh, and though we don't know what was said in that testimony, we don't know if he tried to claim some sort of privilege or if he denied to answer the questions or wanted to plead the fifth or ask for immunity. We don't know what happened. Everything in the grand jury is sealed, like I said. Uh, it seems that whomever this second um, person is that's having a subpoena battle wanted to refuse the subpoena then filed an appeal then was told he had to hold himself in contempt and try again and that's why it's went up to the dc court back down to judge Beryl how back up to the dc court uh, back you know and that's why mm -hmm. it went back and forth was because he, this person had to hold himself in contempt so uh, it, it it had it seems to have happened right around the same time andrew miller did that because you'd think if you were going to do this again that you would know, oh, well, based on what I learned from Andrew Miller, I have to hold myself in contempt of court, and you wouldn't have made that error. Um, I feel like the timeline and the public resistance from Credico matches this sealed subpoena fight. Then on Halloween, Politico published some huge beans, biggest beans, <laughs> way bigger than my beans, suggesting the subpoena was for Trump. Uh, this piece was written by a former federal prosecutor from Southern District of New York who worked under Giuliani, and he feels that Mueller is secretly litigating against Trump for the right to have him questioned by the grand jury. Probably an obstruction. Uh, he says, we know now, thanks to Josh Gerstein's reporting at Politico, that on August 16th, the day after Giuliani said he was almost finished with his memo, sealed um, a sealed grand jury case, which was initiated in Judge Beryl Howell's courtroom. We know that happened. And then September, that was August 16th. Then September 19th, about a month later, Hal issued a ruling, and five days later they appealed it to the D.C. Circuit Court. And we know Mueller prevailed in that circuit court. Uh, he says the clues um, that clues this is Trump uh, are the f here's some clues. Basically, he's like, I think it's Trump. And here's why. First of all, the speed and alacrity with which the case moved back and forth and that Katzis recused himself because mm -hmm. he because he's a Trump appointee. Now, Empty Wheel uh, seems to see this differently. She wrote a piece called No, Mueller probably didn't subpoena Trump yet. Uh, she asserts that the subpoena is likely for a White House figure like John Kelly or Don McGahn or maybe a lawyer like Garten or Fooderfoss. Fooderfoss. <laughs> Or maybe even a journalist like Chuck uh, Hansen, Lee Stranahan, or even Hannity, Sean Hannity. She says, and I tend to agree, that the speed and alacrity aren't that convincing of an argument because they pretty much match Andrew Miller's appeal process. Hmm. And she says, the timeline does, hmm. and she says that the guy who thinks this is Trump um, didn't consider that on October 11th, right in the thick of the litigation, CNN revealed that Mueller had given Trump a set of questions pertaining to conspiracy and Trump had finished them but was holding until after the election. He was slow rolling them. But mostly she feels that if this were Trump, someone at the White House would have leaked it. And I tend to agree with that because the, the White House is the leakiest leak fest <laughs> of all. So I think it's someone in Stone's group. I think maybe Credico. Hannity would be nice too, though. What do you guys think? I don't think it's Trump. I would hmm. love for it to be Hannity. He's so knee deep in this shit. I just wonder, like, what's his angle all the time? Yeah. Because yeah. just being one of Cohen's, you know, clients isn't enough for him to feel so riled up like this so that's a good i think it's a good theory yeah i honestly don't know enough about how the schedule of those work those cases usually work but the speed and alacrity thing was what was convincing me that maybe it was someone that was a super big fish but if she's saying that that's what happened with andrew miller too then yeah, well, i don't think that yeah the the plausibility that that makes it trump is less well miller's hearing is november 8th and this hearing is december 14th so it's right it, it actually might be a little slower yeah uh depending on when the first initiated you know right yeah thing happened and he had to go back and hold himself in contempt and go forward again <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we're going to hear those arguments on november 8th in court 1 p.m not 9 30 <laughs> yeah i think it's fun to think about but i am not convinced that that is what's going on yeah i, I think it's just one of those stone guys or you know or just any of the other people that um uh, Mar marcy wheeler i think her name is named uh, oh. empty wheel um uh, yeah. but uh, i tend to think it's not trump but we'll see this is the cool thing is that we'll find out mm -hmm. on december 14th yeah you don't it think is. it's anyone in the white house either though because you it, think it would have been leaked it could be mcgann but I, I seriously honestly think that it, if it were a white house person we would have heard about it what about like kushner or dtj mm, nah i just i feel like we would have heard that yeah and and the timing is and it's judge braille house court it's right then when Miller was trying to do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. But who knows? Who knows? <laughs>
Anyway, we'll be right back. Hey, Muller Junkies. Do you want ad-free episodes? How about my personal research notes in our weekly newsletter or access to all of our bonus content, including 80 plus bonus episodes? We have a closed Facebook group and a fantasy indictment draft. Do you want to play that? And membership in the MSW book club? All of this can be yours for as little as three bucks a month by heading to patreon.com slash Muller She Wrote. The money goes a long way towards helping us with production costs. Kick in a little more and we'll have thank you gifts, including t-shirts, reusable tote bags, coffee mugs. Or if you just want the merch, you can get it directly from our online store at MullerSheWrote.com. And if none of that blows your hair back, do us a favor and subscribe to us and give us a rating on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us out a lot. Thanks for supporting women in podcasting and women in media. You guys ready for the Fantasy Indictment League? Yes. All right, Muller Junkies, it's crunch time. The election is Tuesday. Uh, We're going to be on high alert mode for indictments the minute the polls close. (laughs) There's like a three hour gap between the polls close and midnight when he could when Muller could slide in some indictments. I'm like, I've been dreaming that he's going to do it like because I feel like Rosenstein and Sessions are going to be fired Wednesday. But if Tuesday night. Mutler can drop some indictments right before the <laughs> after that's the polls be, close. That'd yeah, it's gonna be intense. S- super sweet. I, it's probably not gonna happen. People are betting on Thursday. There's, yeah. you know, there's office pools. Everyone's got their money on something. <laughs> so based on this week's news, I'm going for sure with DT Jr., Ivanka, Eric, Stone, and I'm trying to decide between Wool and Arando. I think the Wool investigation's too new. The investigations usually take about four months. Okay. So I think I'm just gonna have Arando on there. So Junior, Stone, Ivanka, Eric, and Rando. I'm going for the big points. Ooh, okay. I'm going, um, sorry. Now, remember, Cohen thinking, yeah. <laughs> Cohen is still part of an open and ongoing investigation and a bunch of a- unnamed parties in that. And, uh, you know, there's so that could also be it could Cohen could also still be charged with shit, that, mm-hmm. even though he's only been charged with one thing or th- eight things. Eight counts. <laughs> do, you, do you have all the, the Trump kids? Only all eight. three? Yeah. Well, I've got Tiffany, poor thing. <laughs> I've got uh, I put Eric in there because you okay. get you get 20 points for a Trump family member. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea because I was thinking that something dropped about that recently, too, about the Trump Foundation. Yeah. He's info. he's a he's an executive at the yeah. Trump Foundation and the Trump Organization. So okay, that's okay. why I've got all the kids. Yeah. And Stone and Aranda. What if Tiffany's the rando? <laughs> That'd be crazy. She didn't do shit. Baron. No, they're fine. They're fine. All right. Um, I'm going to go. Russian. Oh. <laughs> plot, plot twist. <laughs> I'm going to go with all the kids. Uh, <laughs> all the kids. Kushner. I guess he's a little stepchild nobody wanted. And then, um, yeah, Rando, because that Jacob thing, like I, I would have said it if you didn't say it was fresh, because that's a good point. Um, yeah, Rando for me, too. So no stone. Oh, that's all my five, though, right? Yeah, no stone for me. Not Dude, yet. Dude, stone. You get, I think you're going to want to have stone. Hot water, yeah. This week? I, I think you're going to want to have stone on your thing this week. I guess, yeah. Cause I think it, he's going to be one of the first people indicted as soon as the election's yeah, over. Yeah, because I got the other kids, so I'm just going to take off Eric. Who cares about him anymore? Okay, so you're going to do Junior, Ivanka, Stone, yes. Kushner, mm-hmm. who and I think is still a 20-pointer because he's married he's to Ivanka. Big. Yeah, yeah. And then Rando. And Rando. Yes. Roger. Okay, I'm <laughs> doing um, Stone for sure. I'm going Corsi. Ooh. I hope. Dear God, that guy's such a Isn't fucking he an asshole. asshole? <laughs> oh my God. Ooh. Him and that uh, Broidy dude. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. He just, uh, he, I can't, yeah. Taking pride in starting the birther movement is, reserves a special place in hell for you, I think. <laughs> okay. So Stone Corsi, um, going DTJ, Ivanka, Kushner, and Arando. Was six. that six? Yeah. God damn it. I know. I was like, we had six, man. I'd be on it. But um, all right, I'm gonna take off. The rando is the Ivanka. lowest point. I know, but I don't think. But I think I could stand to gain a point. Yeah, I hate. I'm yeah, trying to play this strategically. But if you're you gonna know? have Eric, you you might. If you're not gonna have Eric, you might as well I take Ivanka off too. Oh, good point. Hmm. Or if you're gonna take Ivanka off, you might as well take Eric off too, because they're you gonna get indicted together. Take, I'm gonna take Ivanka. Eric wasn't on there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I just have a uh, stone. Corsi, Kushner, DTJ, Rando. Got it. Yeah. The Trump org is for less points than an individual, right? Because that would be too easy. The org itself is for fewer points. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm good. Same thing. Yeah. All right. You guys ready for sabotage? Yes. All right. This week, we have a very special sabotage brought to you by Jordan Coburn. (laughs) Dun dun. Oh wait. 
That's just the facts. That's just the facts. <laughs> uh, dun, dun, dun. That's what I meant. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, this is about stone. That's why I got this. Uh, so an article came out by one of our favorites, Natasha Bertrand at The Atlantic, that since September 2017... Uh, since since those hearings that Stone had before the House Intelligence Committee in September 2017, Roger Stone has changed his testimony three separate times. Mm, every time a new story came out. Every time a new story comes out, exactly. He's he tries to switch his story to mold what's happening. This is classic. This is classic lube the truth, but he's doing it when he's under oath. It's so, like uh, Don Jr. changing his um, expenses, financial, financial reports, yeah. statements. Yeah. Every time somebody finds something, he's like, oh yeah, I meant to put that on there exactly exactly yeah exactly <laughs> um an example of one of these switch changes is in 2017 he denied ever having a direct line of contact to wikileaks but now these new emails have been revealed showing that he told at least one senior trump campaign official about wikileaks plans to release emails and his story is now changing yet again seemingly as a result of that story breaking um, he failed to tell the committee about him telling Bannon that a load of emails were to be released, and as the press got a hold of that fact that he did do so, Stone has changed his testimony to fit what comes out in the news. Like, so it's it's. I think this is Roger Stone's gonna. He's perjured himself multiple times at this point, and more beans. <laughs> yeah, he could easily be try. Um uh, charged with lying to Congress multiple occasions. I can't wait until that becomes a thing for them because Sessions right now, I'm like, how is he still even That's what even I'm working? saying. That is it's what ridiculous. I'm saying. How do you, like, why the fuck does it how take... How is he cool to lie to Congress? Yes. Still be the, AG. the highest, yeah. like, lawyer of the land is what... No, or he's, like, the highest, like... Law enforcement official. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't understand why, why, why perjury isn't something that's just, like... Boom, there you go, cut and dry. Yeah. You yeah. Just well, anyone else, I think it would be. And, and people that are not in this white-collar world, I think. It's just another reason we need to flip the mm-hmm. house, because they will hold them accountable. Yeah. Uh, all right. And I don't think that, I mean, we all have stone on our mm-hmm. uh, draft. So Set in stone. Yeah, this that sabotage isn't going to change it. It's just no. going to solidify that. Yeah. If I could fucked. put, like, two stones on there, though. <laughs> <laughs> the whole I stone. Would. Stone yeah, and yeah. stone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's definitely going down. He's... Fucked. 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 Yeah. That was fucking solid. I think that, that was, was our best one. Me too. To date. Good job, guys. Dude. All for you, Roger Stone. <laughs> Hell yeah. You are going downtown, Nixon back, fucker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys, it's time to flip it blue. All right, this week is go time for Flip It Blue. First, I wanted to get a message out to everyone to vote. Vote and bring five friends that weren't going to vote and vote. And I want to see everyone's voting pictures. So tag us on Instagram and Twitter, both at Muller She Wrote. Uh, That's your call to action this week. Uh, It's pretty simple. Go vote, bring five friends, take a picture, tag us at Muller She Wrote. And now uh, I'm talking to you, California. <clears throat> we always feel like we don't need to vote because everything will go our way because we're so blue. But not this time. We have a ton of toss-up districts for the House of Representatives. And how we vote in California will most likely determine whether or not we win the House back. And winning the House back means we get control of the House Intel Committee. We get to take that back from Devin Nunes and give it to Adam Schiff. Uh, we'll have subpoena power to get a-holes like Zinke and Price in for questioning. We'll be able to subpoena. We'll have subpoena power. We can subpoena Trump's tax returns, and Maxine Waters would be the one in charge of that. Uh, we get to control the House Judiciary Committee. That's the uh, good lot guy and the Nadler guy. They switch places. We can fully investigate the Jim Jordan allegations from his time as a wrestling coach when he failed to report a known child molester. California, do not stay at home and expect everything to go blue. We can vote out Rohrabacher. We can vote out Duncan Hunter Jr., and we can vote out Devin Nunes. These are just a couple of, of the races that could make the difference between getting the House back, and we need to put this check on the president. And if you're confused like I am by all the doublespeak in your local measures or want to know what senator or what representative to vote for, I'd like to welcome the CEO of BallotReady.org, Alex Nimchevsky. Alex, welcome to Mueller, she wrote. Thank you for having me. We're really glad you're here, uh, especially this critical days before the the election, it's really important to go on. And, and I I jumped on your site 
um, on BallotReady.org, and it's super easy. You just enter your address, and it brings up all of your local measures and representatives and, and basically everything that's on the ballot and explains it in a really nice nonpartisan way uh, and what voting yes means and what voting no means. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about BallotReady.org, why you started it, and, um, and, and basically just kind of how it works and, and why you did it? Yeah, so in uh, in the la- right before the last midterms, I um I knew my ballot was going to be long. I knew I was I was ready to vote for the candidates at the top of the ballot, but I had no clue about like what a comptroller even was responsible for. There were all these candidate names I didn't recognize. So, I wanted to I I made a site just for myself to prepare myself and it was very ugly and simple back then, but um, after I talked to people, anybody I talked to about it was like, oh yeah, I guess I guess when I vote or I leave blanks. And a lot of people I talked to, you know, didn't even realize there were gonna be more offices on the ballot than like the Senator or um, candidates for governor. Um, so, our goal at Ballot Ready is to make it really easy for you to be informed about every race and candidate on your ballot so that you complete your entire ballot without guessing. And there's a lot of attention in the news and media around, you know, um, the House and the Senate, but this year we are electing over 80,000 people for office. And we know local elected officials have a lot of power over our lives. So uh, the votes in those races matter a ton. So people should be informed in them. Yeah, I agree. I think we, and we talk a lot about this on the show that local politics speaks to national politics. And it's super important that you are aware of or at least educated on, on what the initiatives are. Particularly, I know in California, we always have a ton of ballot initiatives and sometimes the language, they put double negatives in there and you aren't quite sure, like, if I vote yes on not doing something that won't happen, what happens? <laughs> so um, it's really confusing. So I really loved your site and I'm really glad that, that, that you decided to put it together. And I, I think it looks great, by the way. I know, I know the feeling when we first started, we were pretty low budge. So <laughs> I get the feeling. So, but it's, it looks great now. And I think it's really important, like you said, local politics kind of really has more of an impact on our lives um, or not necessarily more, but more specific impact. You know, like it's right here. It's it's how we live and the things that impact us directly. Right, exactly. It's stuff like um, they decide, local elected officials decide funding for schools, for health clinics, potholes, but also um, gun control. Um, they, they have more power over our lives than we realize, but also often the policies that are created at at the local level become federal level policies and the local elected officials later on become candidates for higher offices. So it's really important, you know, for the immediate future, but also for the long term of our democracy for people to be informed about what's going on at the local level. Yeah, that's a great point. There's a lot of, for example, there's a lot of ballot initiatives in a few states to raise minimum wage. And I know that when you do that, um, like two years ago when there when there were a lot of states with um, legalizing marijuana on the ballot, that, uh, you know, if you've got 37 or 40 states who have legal weed, it makes it it makes an impact on the national level. And I think the same with the minimum wage. And, and also it lets you know kind of what those things are on the ballot. Like, do you know that you could vote for yourself to get a raise? Um, <laughs> you should probably head to the polls. Exactly. And um, we, you know, to your point about ballot measures being difficult, like, I mean, they are sometimes purposefully written to be deceptive. And sometimes they're like written in all caps. So if it feels like they're yelling at you. So we try to just make it really easy to understand what a yes vote means, what a no vote means, and deeper information and arguments from the side that wants you to vote yes and the side that wants you to vote no. Yeah, and it's also true that a lot of uh, opposition or support um, from for these <clears throat> for these ballot measures comes out, and it's like you said, purposefully designed to confuse you, 
and um, uh, your site just breaks it down. Here's what a yes vote means. Here's what a no vote means. And that's to me is super helpful because of that deceptive, tricky language. You know, like I said, the use of double negatives or or, uh, you know, just the really confusing language and, and uh, that that they purposefully use. So it's it's very helpful. I, I found it to be I used it. I've got my little sample ballot that I got at home. It takes a long time to go through those measures, especially in California. So it was really helpful. I found it very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it it does. So I live in Chicago and my ballot has over 70 judicial races on it. And going through those, you know, it takes a few minutes. It's not like one minute. It's a, it's a little bit long. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And I it, sometimes I think that that's also designed to confuse people. Just the sheer size of your ballot um, can be intimidating. And, and sometimes measures are put on there um, that nobody really gives a jack about, but they're just there to beef up the ballot to make it look intimidating. Um, so it's... Yeah, it's really important, and I, I really encourage everybody to check out the website. So I really appreciate you taking the time um, to to set it up for for people who so they can go and and just educate themselves. That's the most. That's what I think this administration fears the most is an educated electorate. Yeah, we we just want it to be super easy for people to be totally informed, and even on races where you know they they might not know what that office is for or like they've never really thought about that office before we want people to be able to see that one candidate has this policy proposal and the other candidate has this opposing policy proposal so that they can build a stronger narrative of what happens in local politics so they can be more engaged great and it also helps i think it's inspiring like oh hey if this guy can run i can run so <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, that's actually something we're working on for next year um, is using our data to be able to tell people, given where you live, these are all the offices that you can run for. Here's how to file to run. Here's um, the eligibility requirements. Um, we, we, we're also going to show here's the salary of this office because Sometimes it's more, sometimes people assume that holding an office, a local office is a volunteer position, but often it's paid. So um, that's another way we're going to start using our data. Great. I, I appreciate that. I, I love it when women start taking charge of stuff. Um, it's about time. So <clears throat> everyone head to uh, ballotready.org, enter your address and get started. And don't forget to tag us when you vote at Mueller She Wrote on Instagram and Twitter. Alex, thanks so much for joining us on Mueller She Wrote. Thank you so much. And don't forget to join us election night for our live results watching yeah. party. Um, we'll be video broadcasting. Video. You can see our faces live <laughs> from the second stage or the gold stage or the whatever the second stage is called now at the, at the Comedy Palace um, from 6 to 9 p.m. Pacific time. We changed it. It was going to be 8 to 11, but we wanted to... I was afraid some of the, a lot of the races would be decided by then, so we moved it up to 6 p.m., um, we're having a show on the main stage. Um, Tamara Catan, me, Jordan, Jaleesa, Jesse, Jesse Egan, 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 Zach Miller, uh, Dallas McLaughlin oh, put yeah. some beans on it. Mm -hmm. All the homies. Um, and that starts at eight, doors at seven. Um, and once that show's over, you can, you'll be able to come back and, and watch us do the live broadcast. And if you're at home, you can go to our YouTube channel. You can go to our Facebook page, Muller She Wrote, search that. You can f search for us on YouTube. And I think we have a Periscope. We do have a Periscope. Yep. It's Muller She Wrote. And we are also in the process of creating a brand channel on YouTube and switching over all of our original mm -hmm. stuff over there. So I would say to be extra safe, check out our Facebook for sure, because that will be completely right. Yes. The mm -hmm. YouTube stuff we're working out right now. So before you subscribe to us on YouTube, give us just like a second to, to uh, sort switch out our brand over. channel and switch it all over. Yeah. But yeah. yes, Periscope, Facebook. Um, we'll put it out on Twitter, like the links and everything too. Yeah, so Twitter and cool. Periscope are Twitter. linked together, so it'll definitely be there. Mm -hmm. All right, great. And and you know, I I think it's basically kind of what we're going to be doing is we're going to be watching the results as you guys watch the results. So flip on MSNBC, CNN, whatever you flip on, and it, this is kind of a companion. So on your computer, or your phone, you watch us watch the results. Um, and you know, we'll be, we'll be having interviews and, and doing stories on, on voter suppression, voter turnout. Um, and you know, we'll just be kind of be reporting as, as the night goes on for those three hours. 
and uh, we hope that you tune in. And if you want, ooh, we have a GoFundMe. Um, <laughs> you can search Election Night Live um, for GoFundMe. Kick us a couple dollars. If everyone just gives us a dollar, we will be able to pay for this production. Seriously. I didn't know it was going to be as expensive as it was to do video. Like, so that you Quality can, video, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is not, I mean, you know... <laughs> We our, do our best. <laughs> our patrons help us out so much, but this this production, I don't know how people afford television. Uh, it's crazy Seriously. expensive. Um, just like one camera is $8 million. Yeah. Um, when we were getting the quote from the guy, I remember you were like, uh, yeah. as, as long as it's not like, you know, million, X amount yeah. of dollars yeah. and it winds up being like X 80% of that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, holy shit. I laughed out loud and when I was I read your message. Yeah. Too. I was like, yes. so that was a hyperbole. Yeah. yeah. This isn't going to be like a zillion dollars, right? And then it turned out to be a zillion dollars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the, and, but that's what they're worth. I mean, these guys do a lot of work. They work very hard. It's what they're worth. And so if you can just chip in a buck or two, yeah. um, go fund me at uh, Election Night Live. It would be good for the fans Super. too to see us like in quality video like and not just <laughs> shitty iphone cameras <laughs> right <laughs> we could broadcast on live for free but like mm, yeah, i just i wanted to, to bring that? you guys some graphics and and make it kind of cool mm-hmm. so and it was important for me to, to make it professional yeah and it's historical so it'll be really good to have good video mm-hmm. yes and so it's going to be a companion um to watching the results uh, and we'll have that feed in our ears too um anyway uh, if you're in San Diego, come down to the Comedy Palace. Join us. We'll have a live comedy show, like I said, on the main stage. Um, <clears throat> we got Dallas McLaughlin. I don't know if he's going to put beans on it or if he's going to be in character that night. He's oh. always got something really awesome up his sleeve. Uh, you get a discount at the door if you have proof you voted. Uh, and whatever the outcome, we'll be there together. So vote. Take five friends. This is the moment we've been waiting for. This is our last chance. Uh, remember how you felt November 9th, 2016. This is your time to take that back. So get to the polls, bring friends, and we'll see you Tuesday night. I've been AG. I've been Julissa Johnson. I've been Jordan Coburn. And this is Muller She Wrote. Muller She Wrote is produced and engineered by AG with editing and logo design by Julissa Johnson. Our marketing consultant and social media manager is Sarah Lee Steiner, and our subscriber and communications director is Jordan Coburn. Fact-checking and research by AG and research assistance by Jaleesa Johnson and Jordan Coburn. Our merchandising managers are Sarah Lee Steiner and Sarah Hirschberger Valencia. Our web design and branding are by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios, and our website is MullerSheWrote.com. 